Hi, I'm Tim Jones, and I have a question to ask you. How are you doing spiritually? How are you doing spiritually? I could ask how you're doing physically, but if we were near each other, we could just look and say, yeah, this is how I'm doing. I could ask you how you're doing relationally. All you'd have to do is come into my house or you're in me into your house and say, but I love these people, right? And you can feel the tension, right? I could ask how you're doing emotionally, and you're like, oh, man, it's Thursday? I thought it was. Yeah, I could tell right away there's a little bit of stress going on. I'm asking you how you're doing spiritually. How are you growing? What are you reading? What are you learning? What is God pruning? Is there a desert or is it a land of plenty right now? Like, what is God doing in your life? Where do you see him working? Are you joining him? What's he doing in you? That's what I mean when I say, how are you doing spiritually? Why I ask that is we've been doing this series on superheroes of faith, and this week I am going to be talking about, I'm going to say, an anti-hero. And one of the reasons why I love the Bible, it's filled with imperfect people. Only one perfect person, and that's Jesus. But there's a lot of people I can relate to, and, uh, and I, can, I can say, well, that. And I also know that I learn a lot from my mistakes. And uh, so in this case, there's a guy named Demas that I want to tell you about. Maybe you've heard of him, but he's kind of, Paul talks about him. He was a companion of Paul's. And uh, he's kind of written at the end, but I think we can learn a lot from his life. Now, why I say that, it's kind of weird because there's only three verses, verses about him, and he's just kind of mentioned. So if you go with me, let's, let's go. Oh, wait, let's pray. God, thank you for letting us hear, giving us this technology, working through this technology. Let us, let us know that you want to do something in us. We're here for a reason. Help us to open our hearts, open our minds. Help us to hear something that you want to speak to us beyond even me right now. And God, you're, you're here with us. You're waited for us. And uh, God, do something. And I just ask this in your son's name. Amen. So, three verses. Verse number one. Philemon. There's only one chapter. So verse 23. And then 24. So first, this is the end of his writing. He's writing to his friend Philemon. And at the end, he just throws out these greetings like a lot of his other letters. And he's, Paul writes this. He says, Epaphras, my fellow prisoner in Christ, sends you his greetings. So Epaphras was there, and he probably was under house arrest, maybe similar to Paul, and he says, my fellow prisoner in Christ. But then he goes on, verse 24, he's mentioning four people's names, and you'll know two of them. He says, and so do Mark, Aristarchus, Demas, and Luke, my fellow workers. And so do Mark, Aristarchus, Demas, and Luke, my fellow workers. So we do know Mark, he wrote a gospel, Matthew, Mark, and we also know Luke, Matthew, Mark, Luke, so he also wrote Acts and the, the Gospel of Luke. Don't know Aristarchus and maybe never heard of Demas. But we, what we do know is Paul is having an Instagram moment right now. He first takes a picture of him and Paphras, and he's like, my fellow prisoner, hashtag, right? right? And then he goes on, and, he says, and the second one in, the, in his feed is, is uh, my fellow workers. These are my fellow workers, my boys, right? And he's saying, Mark, Aristarchus, Demas, and Luke. So what do we find out about Demas here is that he was on Paul's team. And I got to tell you, that says something about Demas. To be chosen by Paul, who I'm going to say was a stickler and was very driven guy, and to be chosen by Paul to say, my fellow worker, he wouldn't just say that unless he meant it. So to be on Paul's team says something about Demas. And then to be on mission with Paul, going into towns with the goal of planting churches, going into the synagogue, seeing what they do there, going out to the people, the Gentiles, telling them about Jesus, watching churches be planting, watching lives being transformed in front of you, miracle after miracle, I'm just going to say, must have been an incredible thrill. I'm going to say Demas, at this point in his life, was riding a huge wave. He was a mile high right there. His faith was going. Maybe you can experience that. Like right now, I'm just saying, I would have just gotten back on a youth mission trip to Camp Hope if it wasn't before this, and we would have been out serving in Western Howard, Western Maryland. Um, the week prior, we would have been in Brooklyn with a team of high schoolers too, and we, I would have just had story after story to tell you. I would have been flying high. But those of us who have lived a couple years realize that you can't stay there, right? And neither can Demas, all right? But that's where he's at right now. He had experienced some things, unexplainable God things, that I'm sure transformed Demas. And you would think he's untouchable, that he's always going to be there. But that's not the case. Let me take you to the second verse, Colossians 4, verse 14. Again, Paul's writing to the church of Colossae. At the end of his letter, he kind of mentions some people. 
And he says in this verse, he says, Our dear friend Luke, the doctor, and Demas send their greetings. Now, the question that I had as I was talking to some college kids about this is, what did he mean? What's the comma mean? Is it Oxfordian comma? Is Demas included on the dear friend or not? I don't think so, because if you read it in my translation, it says, our dear friend, which is very singular to me. Luke, the doctor, maybe there was more than one doctor or one, more than one Luke, right? So he's like, our dear friend Luke, the doctor, and Demas. Now, I might be reading a lot into this, all right? But I know how I phrase things. All right, I know I put the best first. For Father's Day, I got a new power tool and socks. <laughs> right? I went to visit a city, and in another world, I saw a baseball game. And we went to museums. I had steak on Friday night and Brussels sprouts. Right Now, I like Brussels sprouts. And, but whatever was the most important, the most excited about, we put first. And then after that, I'm going to call it secondary. And here's Paul writing about his friend Demas. He's saying, our dear friend Luke and Demas. And I'm like, what's going on in Demas's life? That he moved from fellow worker to and Demas. And he wasn't even a dear friend anymore. Like, what is going on? Now, I have, I've been worked with driven people before, and I can, there's tension. I can get it that Demas and Paul maybe, you know, didn't hit it off. Maybe Demas made a mistake and Paul wanted more, you know. You know, I've heard it this way. I've heard of two leadership styles. I was reading an article about Kobe Bryant, who just recently passed away, and a phenomenal NBA player, and LeBron James, and how they had phenomenal, strong leadership, but totally different. Kobe was pretty driven. Like, he wanted, the, he wanted you to show up on time with your best game, ready to go prepared. And if you didn't, he was going to be all over you. He's going to get on your case about it. He, was gonna, he wanted the best out of you, and for you, but also for the team. Now, LeBron had a different leadership. He kind of comes in, kind of talks to you like an older brother, younger brother, kind of is a little bit more chill, do you know what I mean? Just talking story with you, giving you suggestions if you're open. Maybe he says a strong word, but mostly compassion, love, encouragement. Kobe was more like, do it now, right? And I'm going to say, if, if my opinion, I think Paul came from more of Kobe's camp. All right, and I think he might have been tough to de deal with. And I think Demas, maybe they had to run it. Maybe Demas just hit that place he was tired. Maybe he's like, is this really all that I'm getting out of life? Maybe, maybe, maybe there was something else going on that kind of took him away a little bit and he wasn't fully there for Paul and that's why Paul wrote, and Demas. But I'm going to say, I think something happened in Demas' life that Paul noticed and said, and Demas, and Demas. But if we go to the next verse, that I'm going to bring up to you is in the third verse is in 2 Timothy chapter 4, verse 10. This kind of completes the story. It says, Do your best to come to me quickly, for Demas, because he loved this world, has deserted me and has gone to Thessalonica. Let me read that last part again in verse 10. For Demas, because he loved this world, has deserted me and has gone to Thessalonica. Now first, when I was talking to middle school and high schoolers about this, when it said, because he loved this world, middle schoolers were like, well, he's into saving the world. He's into recycling. He's into Earth Day. He, you know, this world, we're stewards of it. We got to take care of it. He loved this world. I'm like, yeah, I get that, but I don't think that's what Paul's saying here. When I talk to high schoolers about it, they're like, oh, Demas just wanted to experience the world, go out and see new sights, taste new food, smell new things, meet new people, right? He wanted to experience the world. He loved the world. He wanted to experience more of the world. And I'm like, yeah, I, I hear you, but I don't think that's what Paul is saying here. I think there was something in the world that was secondary that became primary in Demas's life. Because the next word that he uses is a pretty strong word, and I asked my good friend Jan Harris about it, and she spent, had a military career. I said, how strong a word is the word deserted? And she goes, in, in the military? And I said, yeah. And she said, pretty strong. She said, yeah, you're not messing around. Like, when you abandon a post, you are deserted. That is that is a severe offense in the military branches to be de desert your your fellow warriors. Yeah, you you don't do that, she said. And so Paul, you choosing that strong word, deserted, and has gone to Thessalonica, and he's crying out to Timothy to come quickly. We're at the front line. The things are going on. We need more help. And Demas, who I used to count on, has deserted me because he loved the world. He went on to Thessalonica. Now, my first question is, what was her name, right? That's kind of my joke on this one, especially when I talk to college kids, because, you know, 
So many times we find a new love and it just takes us away, right? But there's other new loves that we can talk about, right? There's things that come into our life. They come in and they're good things, but all of a sudden they become primary. And then God becomes secondary. And uh, we, we've, we've all had to make those choices. And when I ask you how you're doing spiritually, like the choices kind of have to be leaning towards God on that one. So let me give you an example of this one. I was actually heard about this and I went and talked to him. You might know him. His name is Oscar. He comes to the 11 o'clock tr traditional service here at Bethany. Um, but I was, we were in a staff meeting and my good friend Tim Farrell, who's in charge of small group Bible studies here, said he was talking to Oscar and Oscar made this statement. This is Oscar talking to Tim Farrell. I don't know what else to do with my time. And I'm like, I relate to that. We have been given a whole new world of time and what do we do with each day and some days just drift away. What do I do with my time, right? I've been there so, and I have to make a decision. Should I or should I, right? So this is what Oscar decided. He says, so I just started reading my Bible. So I just started reading my Bible. Now, I think Oscar had other things on his mind that he could do, but he thought, well, maybe I should read my Bible. And he went down that road. And you know where it led him? He said, I finished it, Tim, in two months. He said, sometimes I find myself reading for four hours. And I'm like, more than a verse a day? Yeah, for four hours he would read the Bible because he had time. And I think there was another reason. Because when I talked to him, I called him to get permission. He said there was this one point when he finished Malachi. I call it Malachi, the only Italian pro pro prophet. Just joking. Malachi, when he, I just had to throw that in. Malachi, when he finished reading Malachi, he was like, I was like, ah, oh, it's over, he said. I wanted more. And I'm like, have you ever been reading your Bible and it finished? Now, I can say this. I've been reading, I've been watching Netflix, and I've been watching something on Netflix and come to the end of the, the show, and I'm like, oh, man, I want more, right? Like, it ended. I'm so sad that it ended. But could you imagine having that feeling after reading, say, the book of Malachi in the Bible? Like, I want more. I want a sequel. I want another season, right, of Malachi 2, right? So this is what I came up with. This is kind of fun. This kind of brings out that decision point of what am I going to do with my time? Am I going to grow spiritually or not? This is, a, this is Oscar's story. See Oscar. See Oscar read. See Oscar read his Bible. Oscar finished reading his Bible in just two months. And you're like, wow, right? But his Oscar could have made a different decision. See Oscar. See Oscar watch TV. See Oscar watch Netflix on his TV. Oscar finished all seven seasons of You Name the Show in just two weeks. That could have been Oscar's story. That could have been. And I'm going to tell you that we're making these decisions all the time. Are we turning towards or are we turning away? And it's not saying that Netflix, I'm not saying, I'm not doing a guilt thing here. Please don't hear that. Just what are we doing with our time and how are we growing spiritually? You have a lot of other time. Oscar maybe read some days four hours, but there were, if I'm not counting, I think there were 20 other hours in that day that he could have been doing other things. So just where are we growing spiritually? So, so here's the thing on this one. I kind of like, where do you get that hunger, right? So I also want to come up with this idea of how do we demis proof our life, all right? How do we demis proof our life? And I came up with three things. The first one is the and rule. It's going to get a little uncomfortable, and I'm sorry, but I'm not really. So this is what we might say. We've got a lot going on this weekend. Oh, yeah, and church. Do you hear that? Now, I'm not saying about attending. I'm, at, I'm talking more about opening a heart, setting aside time, knowing that you're going to meet with other people to be in community, share your gifts, serve other people, open your heart and your mind to new truths, to worship God. That, when I say church, that's what I mean church. Not about perfect attendance. It's about opening it up. And when I say and church, I'm almost saying and I'm sorry for saying this, but I'm not, and God. Like, I got this, and God. I got this activity, and God. It's kind of what Demas did, isn't it? He said, and there's something else out there that is interesting, and all of a sudden that something else became more important than God, and he chose to walk away from his ministry. And so therefore, Paul wrote, and I'm so glad he used the word, and Demas, because I feel like sometimes we can get into the place if we're honest with ourselves, and we could be saying, and God. So I just need you to ask God, have I done that to you, God? 
Have I said, and God? Maybe not said it, but have I lived that way? Right? And am I willing to surrender that thing? Because I see what happens is God becomes his primary, but then he becomes secondary, then he becomes third dairy, and then fourth dairy, and then you end up on a dairy farm. Ha <laughs> ha, right? But it's true, it happens. It happens. So I just, I just want to challenge you. Be, have a transparent moment with God, because he already knows, but just kind of have a discussion with him. Have I put you, God, in the and spot? The second thing is who's in your circle? This is really imperative, too, because I want people to care enough about me, close enough to me, that they would notice a difference if I'm starting to drift. I'm going to say everybody needs a guy, all right? And why I say that? You might need a girl. I get that. But I need a guy because his name was Guy. He's actually a professor still down at HCC, but I met him about 30 years ago. I love his heart. I love his commitment. And here are some of his factors. He was bigger than me. He was stronger than me, he was smarter than me, and he was faster than me, because I did race him, and it was kind of like my Nissan against a Ferrari. He just pulled out. He actually played football at Stanford University, played guard, so he was a pretty big guy, literally guy, right? And, uh, but I chose him because of his heart for Jesus, but I also told him, I'm stubborn, and I have a thick head, and I need you to use pain if necessary. Chase me down wherever I go. I might fight back, but I need somebody stronger than me, because I am capable of being Demas in this story. And I need people close enough to notice and even say maybe what Kobe would say in a paw format, way that I don't want to hear, but I need to hear. You know what I'm talking about? When you need to hear something, but you don't want to hear something, but you know your soul is saying, you need to hear this. And I need somebody that will pursue me and chase me down. So who's in your circle? So you need, to, you need to identify those people. You need to ask those people, and you need to give those people permission. You need to identify them. Who are they close enough that can see you? And then you need them to give permission to them to say, I am concerned, I am worried, or as maybe for me, you're like me, use pain if necessary to open up my ears so I can hear. Who's in your circle? The third thing, this one is, is kind of big too. All of them are big. The third one is go find a Demas. I'm sitting here in this old chapel. It's beautiful. I just have to think about how many different people have sat in these pews over the years. How many different people? How many times was it the first time that they walked through those doors? The first time they walked through those doors. But more importantly, how many, and how exciting that was. That's exciting. But on the other side of it is, when was the last time they walked through those doors? And I know that death comes, right? Can't avoid that. God's batting 100% except for two people. You can look that up in the Bible. But the last time they walked out the door and something happened with life, Maybe it was a new job. Maybe it was a new interest. But sometime in the seven days, they never came back. And again, I'm not talking about church, but I'm talking about growing spiritually, opening your heart, worshiping, fellowship, serving, all of that. They decided to take a, a, a kind of a bend in the road on their spiritual journey, and they never came back here. They never came back. And I'm going to say this. Maybe, maybe it wasn't this church, but maybe you know some of them. And I'm asking you, identify a demons around you right now. Number one thing you can do for that person is pray for them. Pray that, you know, God has not abandoned them. God is still very loving for them. All right? Number two, you might want to reach out to them. Give them a text. I'm okay with texting in church if it's for this reason. Go ahead, get out your phone right now. Text them. Just say, hey. That's all you have to do. Say, hey, how are you? Question mark. That's all you need to say. That's it. Then the last one is, and maybe you need to take a step towards them and invite them. Because here's my thing on this one. We don't know the end of Demas' story, and I kind of like that. We only know that he was a fellow worker, he was and Demas, and then he deserted and he left. We don't know the end. But I also know this, that Paul spoke in pretty passionate words about Demas, his friend. And I would say you only talk passionately. The higher the passion, the more affinity and love you have for that person. And I'm going to say, Paul did not use those strong words unless he had strong feelings for him. All right? And I also know that if he came back, Paul wasn't going to just give him his spot back, but he had every right to come back because I know that because Paul is a follower of Jesus and Jesus can't wait for lost people to come home. Hear me on that one. He can't wait to, for lost people to come home. And he wants people inside his church to be reaching out to those people and just... Let God do the work. It's not up to us. Let God do the work, and it's amazing being praying for, reaching out to them, and inviting them. 
all right? Let me pray to close, and I'm going to go ahead and invite the band to go ahead. I think Matthew's going to do something. But I'm going to just challenge you. If you want to bow your heads, I'm going to say, come. God is saying to us, come, people of the Most High. You are loved. You are loved for a reason. You have been given grace. You've been given a second life. You are running a race that he has called us to. You are not to be watching. You are to be involved in this game, in this world. God is doing glorious things in the middle of these horrific times. He is relaunching every church, whether they like it or not. Everybody wonders what the new normal is going to be like and when it happens, but God, I know that you know exactly what it's going to be like. And I also know that if you can let brothers sell another brother into slavery, but use that brother to save nations, I know that you can be working in the story of Joseph just like now. You can be doing some great things right now. And you are calling people. And God, we are all responsible for our own walk. And we can encourage those around us and let us be a heart of Bethany and that we encourage those around us. But God, I pray right now for each of us to have a real conversation. If we're in that place of a fellow worker, I'm going to say, keep going, keep going. Get that circle around you, but keep going. But if those of us that have got into some things that sometimes, maybe on some occasions that we say, and God, God, convict us, steer us, lead us back to you. Help us, help us. We need you. We can't do it on our own. We admit that to you now. And the third, God, is if there is a demon around us, God, let us not sit. Let us get on our knees and know that you love them and that you were working in their lives. And God, if it's an honor to be used by you, let us look for ways that we could be used by you in that Demas's life. Let us pray, let us reach out, let us invite. God, you have some incredible things for us right now, but God, you first want our hearts. You want us to come, the mess-ups that we are, to you, because you want to be our Savior again here today. And I praise you for that, Jesus. I praise you for that. Amen.